Open your Bibles to this 23rd Psalm. Each and every morning, I'd love for you to have your Bible available to you. I want you to see what I see. I don't want you to trust me. I'm, I won't mislead you, but I want you to trust the scripture, to see it for yourself. Last night, Mikey talked to us about pausing, finding that space in every day, even breathing and thinking. And we've heard a lot already this morning about what triggers us to busyness and distraction and entertainment. And none of that's evil in and of itself, but it can keep us from better things. Today, we're going to talk about posture. The 23rd Psalm is common. It's a common time as a pastor. I get to use it with people in hospital rooms and at funeral services and at gravesides and in moments of duress because most people think the 23rd Psalm is a pretty psalm. It's a safe, comfortable psalm. But the truth of the matter is, it's a psalm for people in the midst of real life, hard life, tragic life, facing real issues. So what we're going to talk about each morning is we set the foundation for the entirety of the week. And each evening speaker is going to tell us a story of how Jesus demonstrates this to us. We're going to see that the Bible knows what it's talking about. Here's, here's what I want you to think about whenever I get to talk to you in the mornings. Here's it. The truth of this psalm isn't what God wants from us. They are what, what God wants for us. This is what God wants to offer you in the best moments of your life and in the worst moments of your life. Or as we just sang, in the deserts and the gardens, this isn't what God wants from you. It's what he wants for you. Oh, about 10 days ago, I was over at my granddaughter's house and I was getting to visit with her for a little bit. And my daughter-in-law, Madison, said, hey, Finley, you want to tell Grandpa your memory verse today? And she did. Watch this video. And she was done. Two years old. Her mom's investing in her head and heart. I don't know which is cuter, her or those Pokemon pajamas. Both are pretty awesome. But to have my two-year-old granddaughter say the 23rd Psalm to me, I want, to, want you to see on the screen with me the three verses we're going to look at this morning when we talk about posturing ourselves with God. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. Uh, it's supposed that David wrote this. David was a shepherd. You might even remember this, that when uh, Samuel came to pick the king of Israel after Saul had failed and turned over his throne in disobedience, David wasn't, David wasn't even included. Why? Because he was a shepherd. So when David begins this psalm, having experience of being out in the quiet with the sheep, he opens with a very significant line, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't know what you think of when you think of the Lord, that term, but I think of a medieval castle with a rich guy who has everybody do everything for him. Does that spark any imagination in you when you hear the word Lord? We don't use Lord in America. That's not a concept. Uh, we make fun of people trying to lord over us. Actually, David uses the word for Elohim, for Yahweh, for the name of Almighty God. And he, he paints a different picture of lordship, though. If you lived in the days of Jesus or even in the days of David, uh, the shepherd was not a fond job. It was not a job people wanted. It was, a, it was a job that eliminated you from a lot of things. I don't know if you know this, but if you were a shepherd, you were continuously unclean. You couldn't go to the temple and worship God because you were always, uh, how shall I say it uh, delicately, you, were, you had sheep stuff on you all the time. There was seldom a time you were clean. And to think about that, that they had to spend their nights out with the sheep to keep predators from entering in. You saw the, the scripture about Jesus being the gate for the sheep. It's been said that shepherds would lay in front of an opening. They would drive all of their sheep into a cave and they would sleep in the opening of the cave so any chipmunk or crazy animal trying to get to the sheep would be stopped. How would they be stopped? The shepherd's body, the shepherd's life, the shepherd's future. 
I want you to think about this for a second. If you get nothing else from what I say this morning, I want you to stop and realize what we're talking about. The almighty creator God has chosen to take this manual labor to take care of you. This is not a regal deity sitting on a throne getting a pedicure while everyone else does his work. The Lord is our shepherd. His humility is what keeps us safe. His, his humility is what keeps us satisfied. Jesus would even tell us in Luke 15 that a good shepherd has a hundred lambs and one of them breaks away. He leaves the 99 and he pursues the one. It's, it's work our shepherd has to do. And then sheep. Oh my goodness, you guys. If you grew up in Sunday school or you grew up in church where they gave you a little cotton ball and you put little marker dots on it to give it eyes and you put little pretzel legs on it and you taped it to a paper and, and you said, we're the sheep and Jesus is the shepherd, uh, you misunderstood. Uh, let me tell you a few things about sheep. They're dumb. They're not brave. They're not fierce. They have a bunch of predators and they have no defense. They're dirty. They get stuff stuck on them all the time. You can imagine what it is. Uh, they're defenseless, easy for predators. A shepherd has to care for them. Shepherds have to sometimes break sheep's legs to teach them not to get too far away in unsafe realms. How do I know this? Because one time I preached a sermon on the 23rd Psalm and a guy named Carl Nowak, who was a farmer in Remus, Michigan, he walked up to me after church and he looked at me and he said, youngin, be at my farm at 6 a.m. tomorrow. I said, okay. So I drove out to Remus, Michigan, and I went to his farm, and there were sheep. And the minute I got out of my truck, the smell that wafted toward me was worse than you freshman boys. It was horrible. <laughs> it was gagging. And he took me out to his pen of sheep. And they weren't white, fluffy, beautiful little animals like I got in Sunday school. They were brown and gross and had turds and mud stuck on them. And, they, and he, said, he said, do you think, he said, the way you explain sheep, you've never seen sheep. He had a baseball bat that was cut lengthwise, so it was flat. It was rounded on the normal side, but he cut it in half, so it was flat. And he would carry it into the sheep pen, and he would whack one sheep on the butt, and they became woolen bumper cars, as God is my witness. These stupid animals started banging off each other and running around and jumping over each other. And he said, they are so dumb. He said, they will put their head down and start to eat grass and they can end up three miles away and not know how to come home. So I hope I've insulted you enough. When Jesus calls you his little lamb, mm, it's true. <laughs> so here's the point David's trying to make to us as we start. You and I need a shepherd. Oh, it's, it's not because we're gross and dumb and stupid and all that. We could, that's either proven or disproven. But the fact is, every single one of us knows there's certain moments in life we need help. There's certain moments in life it's bigger than us. Some of you are going through that right now. You're going through a period in your life where if, if I painted a fuzzy you know, picture of this great Hallmark moment, this movie that ended perfectly, you're like, I, don't, I didn't get that. Don't tell me that God wants to give me everything and God is going to be so kind to me. Don't tell me that because right now I need somebody to help me. I can't do it on my own. You need a shepherd and the Lord can be your shepherd. This is real life talk David's giving us. You see, he's not saying that God is a shepherd. He's not even saying God is the shepherd. David says you and I if we trust him, he can be my savior, my savior, my shepherd, my God, my Lord, my protector, my provision. There's so much hope in this. For those of you who cannot catch a break right now, and for those of you who are like, I've kind of lived on scholarship. I don't know that I've ever had any trouble. You see, God can guide all of us if we let him. But to receive, this is key. To receive the Lord as your shepherd, you have to let him put you in places and positions you may not have chosen for yourself. Let me explain. It says in the, 23rd, in the first verse of the 23rd Psalm, I lack nothing. Is that true for your reality right now? Did you come here this week like, no, no, everything's perfect. I wouldn't change a thing. Not a single person in this room. Some of you are already hating Friday coming and you get to go home. Some of you are, are starting to consider what's going on. And for some of you, you 
no one's shepherding you, or the wrong people are, or you've made choices to go in the direction someone led you and you wish for anything in the world you could go back and erase five minutes of your life. You see, our shepherd meets our needs so that even when we lack, he says, I lack nothing. When we walk through grief, when we lost someone or something that we loved and we cared for, when we're struggling with illness, disease, or pain, and there's a lack of good health, when we go through difficulty in our family and our, we're struggling, how can we say, I lack nothing? Because if you take the story of Job, you'll realize even when your life lacks something, God is the answer to what you lack. You see, sometimes the blessings in life is not that God gives you something new. Some of the great blessings God will ever give you in your life is when he takes something away from you. Not to punish you, but to show you that he is a shepherd that will guide you, that he will lead you, that he will bring healing and strength and wisdom when you lack. He never lacks. He wants to provide for you. Look at verses 2 and 3 with me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. Mr. Nowak on his farm in Remus, Michigan showed me something. He taught me something really clear. You cannot make a sheep lie down. You can't force them to. They will only choose to. If they're scared, they will not lie down. If there's, if there's a threat from a predator in the area, they will not lie down. If there is friction with other sheep, if there are too many in a space, they will not lie down. And then he showed me something funny, and I thought it was funny. No one ever laughs when I tell this story, though. He took this big fat lamb, just wool in his, it's had the biggest sweater you've ever seen in your life. And he flipped it over on its back. And it couldn't get up. Oh, don't give me awe. It was hilarious. <laughs> this fat sheep with its legs like this in the air couldn't flip itself over. And he said, do you know what they call that? And I said, no. And he said, that's a downcast lamb. Do you ever hear the passage, why so downcast, oh my soul, put your trust in God? And he said, if I left it there for a half hour, the worst thing I could do is flip it over on its legs because all the blood had rushed out of its legs. Your legs have fallen asleep, right? And he said, if I took that lamb in a half hour and I flipped it over, it would break all four legs. I wanted him to prove it, but he wouldn't because he's kind. <laughs> but he said what he has to do is he has to massage the legs of the lamb to get the blood back in it. You see... God's not only our shepherd, God's a good shepherd. When we get upside down and we're broken and we lack, God not only brings us to a place, but he sets us upright. He gets us ready for what he has. And he takes us to green pastures. And I didn't understand that, but Mr. Nowak told me the reason a shepherd chooses where his sheep eat or the sheep will eat anything, and then this was hilarious to me, but none of you are laughing. He said, if you send sheep into a field with noxious weeds... They blow up. And I was like, really? I've been on YouTube. I've yet to see it. But they get gassy and they can't release it. And all of a sudden, their stomachs blow up and they die. Your shepherd's leading you to what? Green pastures that he's inspected, that he's prepared for you. You see, even when God leads you to dark places, he leads you for a reason. And then he says, he takes me to still water. I didn't understand that, but it, Mr. Nowak looked at me and said, you ever sw uh, gone swimming in a wool sweater? And I said, no, sir. And he said, why? And I said, because it would make it hard to swim. And he goes, that's why lambs don't go near rushing water. Because if they fall in, they're dead. I just want to read this again, if you'll put it on the screen. He makes me... Oh, that's all I wanted to point out. Your posture is not how you prepare yourself before God. Our posture to find rest is when we present ourselves to our shepherd and we say, I am trusting you to lead me because you are good and you are kind and you will take me to fields that feed my soul and you will take me to cool, refreshing water that I need with safety and protection. And when predators come around me, I know that you were there. You will guide me in the right ways. Our posture is not what we do. Our posture is presenting ourselves to God so he can place us. He will make us lie down and rest. He will make us drink refreshing water. He will restore our souls because he's good. You see, we need a shepherd. 
Every single one of us needs guidance and protection. On our own, we cannot defend ourselves. We have to follow the shepherd and trust even when the path he leads us on is unknown or not where we want to go. You see, we don't follow him well, do we? We're rebellious sheep who run away, and that's why sometimes shepherds have to break a lamb's leg to teach it to stay close, because on its own, it's only going to die. So our shepherd came to find us. We were all the lamb who walked away. And our shepherd came from heaven to walk in flesh on earth that he would find us, that he would rescue us. For some of you, you're meeting this shepherd for the very first time, and for some of us, we're being reminded that when he calls us by name and he guides us and directs us, he's good. He brings healing and safety and nutrition. He lays his life on the line that we might live. And now that you can return to him, will you place yourself at his feet? Will you trust his voice? Will you trust his guidance? Will you trust his correction? Who is your shepherd? Because you're going to have one. Is Jesus your shepherd? Because he says, come to me, all you who are weary, who life has laid heavy upon, and I will give you rest. Pray with me. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for guiding us when we didn't trust you. Thank you for speaking when we didn't want to hear you. Thank you for coming to earth to show us a love that we never could fathom and you died to give it to us and we rejected you and we were the reason, our sin was the reason you were killed and you demonstrated that you will lay in the gap for us to the cost of your own life that you might protect your sheep. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for being our good shepherd and Holy Spirit, thank you for teaching and speaking to us because we hear your voice We can trust him. By the power of Jesus' name we pray. Amen.